I learned how willing people are to, to talk about innovation. It's like a kind of collective quest to really work out what it's all about. Because I don't think anyone sees the whole picture. Big companies often squeeze out the most uh, innovative, creative types. You know, the big corporation attacks right. the, the, the yeah. different. And they sort of do that to people as well. Yeah. So what makes corporate innovation different than total independent free market autonomous innovation is that you need revolutionary people, um, but not too revolutionary. What distinguishes the successes from the failures is not their vision, it's the people who knew where the line was. Because the people that push revolution too far get shot. Real innovation is about changing the rules of the game. It's not about technology, it's not about, uh, you know, strategies. It's, it's changed the rules of the game because the rules of the game are the ones that inhibit you in being extremely creative, in being very forthright, in having fast-track implementation. The rules of the game make it impossible to innovate. It's almost like the pioneers and the farmers, I always think. You know, the pioneers do something that no one else has ever done before. Most people are much more comfortable farming than they are pioneering. And I think that's what big companies do, and they get better and better at farming and farming and farming until everyone realizes, well, you know, there's a different game in town. When you find a kind of a new insight, you know, when you're searching, let's say you've gone from 20 to 22 percent, you know, you've got a little chink. What, what do you do with this? I think if you've got a, a concept, an idea that is easy, I think you've always got to think about how, how easily can the consumer get this idea. If I was going to bring out another colour of an M&M, if I was going to change a variety of a, of a Whiskers product, then a consumer will get that because it's in their current world. I think they'll be quite happy with it. I think, you know, words is probably enough. I think if you go into an area that's the biggest step you've got to take, and I think you've got to look about how do I bring this idea to life. I collect um, examples of products that have been hugely successful that failed in research. And, the, and they're all the type of things that changed behaviour. And Bailey's Irish Cream, although it, it's hard to remember now, but it was the first chocolate liqueur. Liqueurs were always hot and they burnt your chest, you know, when you... And it was like trivial, it was almost childish to have a chocolate liqueur. And the guys who invented it did some focus groups and everybody to a person rejected it verbally. Although they noticed that they kept asking, you know, can I have another one? Had they carried on in research until they tried to get a statistically big enough sample of people to say, yes, we really think this could be big, it would never have been launched. In their case, they hid the research from senior management. They pretended that it never happened and they just launched it. They just um, piloted it in bars in London and it's now the world's biggest selling liqueur. The biggest challenge these corporations are, they take a strategic option for A, B, C or D. It doesn't fit into their core business, supply chain managed operation. And if it doesn't fit, it can't go in. Talking about ideas and pushing ideas and idea generation and brainstorming and managing ideas and ideas, 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 what I'm not hearing, which I find quite interesting is a bit about what is the insight that's underpinning the ideas? It will be an interesting idea that will be highly discussed in the science and in design, but it can't get into the mainstream. So there is a need to be able to see how you can get through that supply chain. And then the third one is how do now the marketing people get the message across? I think research should be mind expanding, not risk reducing. There's like a distinction that needs to be made between incremental innovation and let's say, you know, game-changing, you know, uh, innovation. Breckett Binkiza is smaller, more flexible, more agile. It seems to have a bravery, a boldness about some of the things you do. Do you have a sense, do you even have a sense internally of why the way that you're doing it just seems to be outperforming your nearest, uh, nearest and dearest competitors. Our culture is not just important to our success, it's also important to how you know, we develop our open innovation approach as well. Um, four core values, uh, you know, achievement, commitment, 
teamwork, entrepreneurship. We have some extremely smart people in R&D, but we use people outside, and this is one, another of the success factors of our open innovation approach, is that we recognize that there are many more resources outside the company and many more potential solutions available outside the company. Here we are, you know, 2008, and we think that open innovation is this new concept that, you know, that we found. And WD40 was actually an example of it. There are 285 of us, and our annual turnover worldwide is 314 million. So open innovation is how we live. We can't do it without partnership. And we partner on the front end, we partner on the development end, we partner on the design end, we partner on the manufacturing end because we have no factories of our own. So we really are essentially a collaborative company. We're very pragmatic about where we will get a solution. You know, our chief executive was quoted in an interview in the Financial Times in January as saying, we'll take ideas from anywhere. We'll we're, take them from our competitors. We're not proud. That's exactly. Right. He said that. He said, we're not proud. But that is such a, such a, 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 a difference. I mean, I remember because big companies are proud of their R&D. It, it's part of what they, you know, 1,200 PhDs sitting, you know, busying themselves with, uh, you know, with, with, with sort of chemical problems, and they're very proud of it. No consumer has ever gone to a shelf, picked up a product and said, wow, developed with internal R&D resources, I'll buy that. <laughs> it's irrelevant to the consumer. If we see something that's fantastic, and we'll look at, uh, look at it and say, will it get us to market faster with a better product than other routes. Do you believe in, if you like, almost having the entrepreneur at the center that holds it right the way through, or do you even change leadership? Do you advocate changing leadership as you go? If you look at a lot of the teams, yes, there may be one formal leader, but there's often what we call a core set of people who are leading the activities of the team. Uh, and so uh, that group might shift who is the lead at any moment in time. One of the things we found uh, trying to test creativity no. was that the people who were highly correlated with creativity yeah. were tended to be rather individualist. Mm -hmm. The prickly, difficult, yeah, not very social. Right. I mean, literally, you know, not good team players. This is actually one of the critical aspects of Game Changer because the inventors themselves um, are indeed just like you described. And I learned to love them for it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I recognize that this is one of the things that makes them intolerable to an organization. And so what we in Game Changer, we're not the people that are actually doing the inventing. We're like the investors in the venture capital fund that are sponsoring and guiding these things. So here's this mad scientist over here. We offer an interchange mechanism. We can talk with them and appreciate their things. But then we can help these other people who just hate mad scientists. Uh, understand that, hey, boy, this actually works, you know, and to see, to put it in terms that they can understand. So in some ways, Game Changer team members are like universal translators. Every business book and every business um, uh, story is always, always about hero worship and the success. success. And it leaves the impression, which is wrong, that everything those people do is, is, gold, is gold lined and everything they touch turns to gold. And it's so not the truth. And I wonder whether there's got to be a way you know, to, to, to kind of collect up the failures. The failures that led to success in the end. M mistakes and failure is not only a part of innovation, it seems to be an essential kind oh, of yeah. part of innovation because big companies often really struggle with failure. Failure is not good, we don't want failure, you know. Oh no, WD-40 com company culture actually nurtures failure in the sense that they nurture innovation. Most good ideas get shot down before they ever get to your doorstep. So uh, the idea is here, if, if we can somehow approach the corporate culture from, uh, and create space you know, when we're not present that allows people to be innovative, then I think that will allow Shell to be more innovative and, and allow Game Changer to help. Learn by doing, learn by observing, learn by failing, learn by testing, and, and, and that's really what we're missing. I've worked on a project where we've taken an idea and realized it and put it out to store test and, and tried it. And it bombed completely. Did Why it? did it bomb completely? It? Yeah. Yeah, go on. Because the insight, you know, this is me going way back in yeah, my yeah, product yeah. development days, but it's the insight, there wasn't an insight, fundamentally. Clients should be helped to see that the idea that has that massive polarization in it 
is much more interesting than another idea that has less emotion and energy, but it doesn't have any negatives. But then you take a risk with your career. And people who work in big companies, do they care enough personally? I mean, it, it, if they care about their career, they should make one decision. If they care about what is meaningful to them and following their sense of innovative passion, they make a different decision. Do you care? Do you care to um, show or not show your passion because of the consequences of it? If you uh, are scared or you're not really comfortable with what the outcome would be, then you probably won't show. But if you say, this is what I believe in, this is where my passion is, I'm going to take it to the table, I'm going to talk about it, I'm going to show it, it's in every sweating pore that I have, uh, then you probably will get to the right place. I don't know if you've ever seen the Guinness uh, Horses, Surfers campaign. Beautiful campaign with basically these Hawaiian rolling waves. And they, they'd animated uh, computer graphics, these white horses, literally galloping through the waves whilst these guys were surfing on the long boards. Um, and I think it was, why was it Guinness? Well, it was black and it was white, and it was good things come to those that wait. And it absolutely bombed in the brand leading ad test. And Diageo just said, we're gonna do it anyway. Um, so I suspect they, those are the ex exceptions, the ones we know about, because there have been many other things that have been killed um, that probably could have done the same thing. Some of the most famous adverts were either never tested, because people knew that they wouldn't work, or they were tested and they got a bad result and someone brave just said, let's do it. Mm -hmm.